All right, so hydrogeology 420, Geo 420 on 420. Haven't had any edibles this morning. <laughs> We're gonna talk about slug tests. And we did these slug tests in wells up at Lolo Creek. And you know, you remember the idea. Um, so the idea was that we, we took this, we had our well and we put, we physically displaced the water. So we put a slug into our well. So we had a well and its initial water level was here. Then we, we dropped our slug in here, which was this PVC pipe. And that caused the water level to rise. Right? And then we re, this water level was now above the ambient water table. So the water flowed out of our well into the aquifer. And we watched it recover back down to our initial water level. So when we look at the head here for a water, for a slug test, it'd be sort of constant at this background level and then it would jump up at T1 where we put the slug in and then it recovers back down to H naught. And then we did the flip thing we just pulled the slug out, right? That dropped the water level. And we saw it uh, recover as water rushed to fill back in that head back to H naught. So that's the basic idea of a slug test. You guys have done them. You've watched the water level recover. And uh, what we're going to use or talk about first is what's called the Horselev method for interpreting these slug tests. And the Horselev method is by far the most commonly used method for slug test interpretation. Um, and was almost certainly developed by an engineer. Because what Horselev did was say, hey, look, this curve looks like an exponential. And um, and that the how quickly it recovers all right so if i if i recovered really quickly or took much longer to recover the shape of this curve or how fast it recovers is a function of the hydraulic conductivity so basic idea is exponential recovery the speed of recovery all right which is also 
in fancy speak, that's called the folding length of the exponential. Uh, is proportional to the hydraulic conductivity K. So these are the just the t the fundamental idea behind Horselev interpretation. So. We're going to define the drawdown ratio. Not ration ratio. Drawdown ratio. And that is essentially, we're going to give it this uppercase H. Uh, I'm just going to make this a function of time. All right. And this is basically the drawdown at any time normalized by the initial drawdown right after slug in or slug out. And we could write this as H of T, the height of the head at any time, minus H naught, my initial height, over H, one where h1 is th this is h1 not h by h1 and this is h1 all right these are our initial peaks or valleys so h1 minus h naught so all this is is a normalized draw it's a normalized drawdown it says just take the drawdown that we measure at any time and normalize it by the total drawdown we saw right after slug in or slug out, the peak drawdown. So at, at any point here, H1 minus H naught, this is my peak drawdown right here. And all I'm doing is normalizing the head at any point here, H sub T or H of T, I'm just normalizing it by this total distance here. So at so what that does is it means that my drawdown ratio for a slug test basically always starts at one, all right? And then decays away down to zero. So, if I make this drawdown ratio, H will basically always start at one. Here's T equals T naught. And this point is basically what I pick to be the peak. All right, you're gonna go in to your data set and you're gonna say, oh, hey, I see right here where we put the slug in. Here's my peak head, all right? That is T naught and that is H naught. And so we'll always start at one at that point and then it'll decay down to zero. And the shape of this curve, whether it's really steep or really flat, all right? This is a function of the hydraulic conductivity.
All right, so here's the Horselev equation. Our drawdown ratio H is equal to E to the minus K F A T. Yeah, of course it doesn't matter. I could write it anyway, but it's K times F over A. I could write, I could order that any way I wanted though. Is T also exponential? Yep. Yep. So Finch asked the same question as Autumn. It's all E to the minus KF over A times T. Yeah, I'll show you exactly what we do here. So let's define these. So this K, well, this is my hydraulic conductivity. F is a factor that incorporates different well configurations. So this is how you know it was derived by an engineer. It has a fudge factor in it. They make a simple equation, they put a fudge factor in it. I like to make fun of engineers. I have a master's in engineering. So when I do that, I'm just making fun of myself. All right, fudge factor, which incorporates well configuration and what do i mean by that well i've put a table up in moodle and i'll pull it up here So let me, I'm going to answer that question in much more detail here in a little bit, but good question. Let's first talk about what F is. So here's a table that's up on Moodle now, and it gives you F and how you calculate it for a bunch of different well types. And what you have to do um, is decide which one of these best fits the wells that we used, all right? And then you, we have to use the dimensions of the well in order to calculate F. So for an example, if you remember, we had wells that were cased down to a certain portion in the aquifer, and then they had generally five foot screens over a certain portion. All right, so there's a whole bunch of these. This first one is an uncased hole or as if we just had a well that was screened from land surface down to the bottom, all right? So that would be this one. Well, that doesn't really fit what we're doing here. The second one is if we had this and we just put casing in and the only way water got in was an open bottom, all right? So this is a cased hole, soil flush with the bottom. This is generally just called an open hole or open bottom piezometer. And that's not what we had. And then the third one is a cased hole with uncased or perforated extension of length L. All right, that's basically what we had. We had casing down to some depth. And then after that, we have this extension L. 
which is screened in our case. So in that case, F is given here as two pi L over ln L over R. And R is the radius of the well and L is the length of the screen. Okay, they actually they actually give you an equation where you could pick two points and two times and calculate hydraulic conductivity. I'm going to show you a better way to do this. Because picking two points is a little sketchy. It's okay if you only have two points, but we have these like really high quality data with points every 0.5 seconds. All right. The bottom line is you calculate F, all right? Now A is the cross-sectional area of the well. That's the area over which water flows into the well. That's the, in, in our case, that's the area of the screen. All right, that's the area across which all the water is flowing into our well is the surface area of the screen. No, it's the full surface area of the screen. So it's, I'll put that surface. It is 2D in radial dimension, in radial coordinates, but it's, it's a three dimensional surface. Well, it's a surface area. Of a cylinder. Okay, so let's do this. If I were to take my drawdown, and I'm now gonna plot the natural log of my drawdown versus time. So that would be lin h is equal to natural log of e to the minus k a f over t. All right, so then this would be lin h, these two cancel is equal to minus K A over F times T. Good, that doesn't happen. K F over A. And so what this says is the natural log of H versus time, it's, it's just a linear, it's gonna be a line and my slope is minus K times F over A. 
So if I was to take our data and plot it, I should see something roughly like a straight line if I plot the natural log of this drawdown ratio versus time. And the slope of this line The slope is equal to minus k f over a. And the intercept here, you know, it's got to be equal to one. Well, it's the natural log of one, which would be zero. natural log when my h is equal to one, log of one is equal to zero. Okay, so the very best thing to do here is to just plot up natural log of h versus time. And then use linear regression, get this slope. You gotta, you wanna force the intercept to be zero here. Get this slope. You, you can calculate F and you can calculate A from your well geometry. And so you can easily isolate K. This way, you use all your data over this whole time, and you're going to get the best hydraulic conductivity. How do you plot the natural log of H? Just take your data. You got like in Excel, if I had a column that was this H, I'd make another column that was equal to the natural log of H. And then I would plot those two. But yeah, just do the calculation, get to those that list of natural log of H's and then plot that versus time. You should use that transducer data because that's, you got really good measurements every 0.5 seconds of the, of the head. Now you got to go in, you got this long record. So you got to go in, you got to isolate the start and the stop of a slug test. All right. That's just going into the record and figuring out where does it start? Where does it stop? Pull that out. And then you just, then from there, you can really easily calculate. You'll have, you'll basically have this measurement of head, I think is what we have it in, in meters, right? Well, it's water co height column. But all you got to do is this thing. You just got to put plug this in. To calculate H, you just plug this in. You got to decide what your equilibrium water level is and what your initial water level is, right? The start of the slug test. And then you, you can just calculate this H for, so, so I would have a column that's like my measured water level for my slug test that I isolate. Then the next column would be this big H where all I gotta do is I just gotta get H sub naught as my background water level before the slug test started. And H1 is my water level right after the slug was in or out, doesn't matter. Usually you do. Your tendency when you're first doing slug tests is you really splash it in there and you don't get it all the way in and pulling it out's usually cleaner. Doesn't matter. And you've got three or, you've got three or four of these slug tests. So, Typically what a person would do there is do it for all three measurements and see sort of how they compare. 
unless one of the slug tests is just horrible and then you're like, we're not going to use it. Um, so at any rate, you isolate the slug test, you calculate H using this equation here. Then you would have another column that just is the natural log of H. And you plot that versus the time. And you want it to be the elapsed time now. Right, you want it to be the time in seconds since things started. So that's the other trick, I guess, is calculating the elapsed time. It's not that hard. You, you, I think you have that actual number. But also, you know, every measurement is 0.5 seconds. So. It's also really easily just to have a series that starts at zero and goes up by 0.5 till the end of the, the series. All right, so in a perfect world, you fit all the data with this line and you're gonna get your best fit uh, slope. And then you use the F and the A that you can calculate from the well geometry and you calculate hydraulic conductivity. That's the best way to do it. Now, if, if I wanted to pick two points, so let's say I didn't have this good transducer data and I wanted to pick two points, uh, and this point here is H1, T1, and this point down here is H2, T2. Then I could take these two points, I could put them, uh, I could subtract the equations for those two points. So I would have something like this, lin H1 minus the natural log of H2 is equal to minus K A over F times T1 minus T2. So all I've done is put H1 and T1 into this equation and then H2 and T2 into this equation and then subtract those two, all right? And then I just do some algebra here, lin H1 over H2, that's just the rules of natural log is equal to negative Ka over F T1 minus T2. And then I can solve for K. So K is equal to A over F one over uh, T two minus T one terrible T. All right, so with two points, now I just need two points, H2, H1, T2, T1. I still need to calculate A and F from the, my well geometry, but I can get an estimate of K with two points. And if we go back to the table, that's all they've done here. And they've just substituted in the expressions for F and A and simplified as much as they can. But this mm -hmm. generic this generic equation works for all of them. You just calculate F in the way that you're supposed to and A in the way that you're supposed to. In the original equation, it was KF over A. How did you get it to be KA over F? Let me make sure I wrote it right in the original equation. I 
I do see that I have. Uh, yeah, this. is or have I written it wrong? This is written wrong. It's K F over A. So I've written it wrong here. And then when you do the algebra, it's K equals A over F. So Finch was asking how I got to here when I wrote this wrong. So I just corrected it. Should be K F over A. All right, let's see. I can't remember in the homework, did I ask you guys to calculate it with other methods? Okay. Yeah, so Bauer Rice. All right. Um, so that's the Horselev method, uh, most common way we do it. And really simple, easy way. I'm trying to decide whether we can do the Bauer Rice. We we I have written Python functionality to do the Bauer Rice. Yeah, let's, don't actually have to use the Python stuff, but, um, It's a lot easier if you do. <laughs> um, let's do this. For now, let's take that question off. The homework. If we have time on Thursday, I'll show you guys what the Bauer Rice is and how we would use it. But the bottom line is, in, in quick summary, Horselev test is just a fully empirical. The Sky Horselev said, hey, look, this function looks like it's exponential. And then they made some fudge factors. And they did this. Um, you know, in places where they had measured the hydraulic conductivity in other pump test methods. 
and figured out sort of how the horse love works. It's the most commonly used because it's the easiest. It's not really derived on any kind of true solution to the groundwater flow equation. And so the Bauer Rice slug test is for an unconfined aquifer and in and it is it uses a real solution to the groundwater flow equation in unconfined aquifers given the boundary conditions of a slug test and it should do a better job of fitting the response in unconfined aquifers which is what we're in in lolo creek it's elegance in that it actually does comes from a physical solution comes at the expense of being much more complicated so the expression is no longer a simple let's fit a line and put a fudge factor to it it is quite complicated um and we're just we're running out of time and i just don't know whether it's worth it so if we have time on Thursday, we'll talk about it and, uh, and we will um, potentially even run, run the Bauer Rice using the Python utilities, but only if we have time. Yep. Let's, um, I think we can add this right now while I'm thinking of it. So I'm gonna throw this up. This is the drawdown curve data that I extracted. So all I've done all I've done is uh, yeah, let me um, Yeah. We'll probably run this um, hopefully in class on Thursday, but I have a, I've written a Python script that does the Tice curve matching for you and calculates the best fit hydraulic conductivity. So this blue line is the Tice curve and this red line is our drawdown that we observed. And uh, the good news here is that, you know, we're seeing a pretty reasonable early time Tice response. You can see it starting to fall off here as we go on. And that's probably because we're starting to see the unconfined response show up in our data. But the early time Tice is working out pretty good. Um, so all I've done is go in and extract the data from our pump test. So I just figured out what the start of it was, what the end of it was, and then I plotted it on log log scale so that it'll work for the curve matching. So you guys do, you guys can, I'm, I'll throw the data up on Moodle right now while we're watching, but this will work for the curve matching that you know how, that you now know how to do. So let me put that up into the final project right now. Um, you, so to answer your question, you could make it in Excel, no problem. 
it has to be in log log and you have to make the axes square such that the log that one log uh, scale here in the X has the same distance as the log scale here in the Y. But other than that, it doesn't matter. It could be in any system. It just needs to be a square log axis because you're going to go in and sort of in PowerPoint, we stretched it so that those log scales were the same as the type curve. Um, but you don't have to do that now. I did the I did the extraction and turn into drawdown for you. Oh yeah, good question. Yeah, that's basically what it would be. It would, it you could use it either before you pumped or after. It's probably the actual the total drawdown here is not ten to the third meters, so something's wrong there. So this is our pump test here. So here's your slug test, right? Slug in, slug out, shenanigans. Things got tangled up and all kinds of chaos, but there's a decent slug in and slug out. I can tell that the deucer cord got tangled in the slug or something here. Um, so like this one, I just wouldn't even use. I'd just get rid of that whole sequence. But these ones are pretty, like that's that's good. It's a good response. All right, so here's the start of our pump test. So it goes from, so here's us sort of bumbling around uh, trying to get that damn pump to work, right? And then we finally got the pump working. So right here is where I actually started the drawdown curve. And it goes from about, the water level goes from about 15 point uh, five five down to 15.38, so it should be by 0.2 meters. So it's not going to be, you could use either B, you're not going to get a massively different hydraulic conductivity. Now let's see what the heck's going on with my. Uh, bottom line is for now. Don't use that tie state I just put up until I figure out why the drawdown is definitely not 10 to the third meters. So something is wrong here. <laughs> There's a bug in my code. I'm, divi I'm, I'm dividing by something really small. Um, so don't, don't use, don't use that. Yeah, I'll get it corrected 
I have a meeting right after class, so it probably won't be till noon that I finally get it figured out. But we don't have time for me to debug my code right at the moment. Yeah, so there's two ways to go about this. Uh, Autumn, I think it was that asked this question. Um, so we're, the, the question says, find the effective hydraulic conductivity. I think, what does the question actually say? Yeah, I'll just give you an I'll just give you a matrix conductivity. I talked with Autumn about it. You could either there's a couple ways to skin the cat, but probably the easiest thing to do is just for me to give you a an effective hydraulic or matrix conductivity. So use 10 to the minus eight meters per second. Km is 10 to the minus eight meters per second. So we know the belt's a mudstone, a muddy siltstone. Really, the matrix conductivity is really very low. So 10 to the minus eight is a good low number. Then you should be able to just use that effective hydraulic conductivity equation. That, that was what I wanted you to do. So you could also just use the slug tests and calculate the effective hydraulic conductivity, but it, but it'd be cool to compare those two methods. So uh, 10 to minus eight. So, We're going to use uh, this idea of superposition to do something really important right now. Um, and then we're going to, it forms the conceptual basis for how we do the alluvial stream water accounting stuff. So, Remember that the, princi the principle of superposition says we can add solutions to partial differential equations. together to simulate more complicated plate, uh, simulate I got to put a caveat in here. This is linear PDEs, even though we don't simulate more complicated settings. So we use this already in calculating the drawdown from multiple wells at a point, right? We added, we just added the calculated Tice drawdown from several wells together to get the total drawdown at a point. Now remember, the Tice solution was developed for a single well pumping with a uh, infinite aquifer extents, all right? And so the Tice 
the fact that we can just add tie solutions together makes it so that we could take this solution from a single well and calculate the total drawdown from multiple wells. So now we're going to consider the situation where, let's say we're um, in, um, oh, let's say we're here, we have a big, uh, so here is Mount Sentinel. So here's the M trail, right? And um, here's the Clapp building. And let's say we've got a big pumping well right here, right outside the clap building. So this is mountain block. And over here, I'm in the alluvial aquifer system, right? I'm looking down in plan view. I'm just giving us some idea. And I want to calculate the drawdown in this well, and it's pumping out water at some pump rate Q sub P. All right. And I want to calculate the drawdown. And I've got this drawdown cone after some time of pumping. And it looks like I got some head contours. but they are now starting to run into this mountain block. All right. So this mountain block here is an aquifer boundary. All right, so remember the Tice equation assumes that I'm in this infinite aquifer, that I never reach a boundary, all right? But in many cases, we've got wells near boundaries. And so we have to figure out how we might be able to deal with these boundaries. Well, I'm gonna look in map view here. So uh, let's call this an, an impermeable. For now, we're gonna say the mountain block doesn't contribute a lot of water and we just hit this impermeable boundary. So now let me draw, let's consider this uh, a cross section here. A to A prime, and let's just look at, at what we have here. So uh, here's the land surface. All right, we've got a fault here, and this is bedrock. And here we're in alluvium. And our pumping well is right here. And uh, we got this water table. Originally, and then we start pumping. And now we've got this drawdown comb. At some time later, here's what our water level looks like. But I want to know what my drawdown is over here. This sort of hypothetical one assumes that I could just pull water from this side indefinitely, but I've hit the boundary. And what do I what I do know is that I can't I cannot pump 
Oh, I lost my mountain block. That's not good. What I do know is that um, I cannot pump water across this mountain block. It's an impermeable boundary. And so what I know is that at this level, what does the hydraulic gradient have to be so that no water flows across here? How did my battery just go so dead in 30 minutes? That's crazy. If I have if I have no flow this direction, what does that tell me about the head gradient in the X direction right there? Well, remember, what's Darcy's law, little Q? Okay, uh, and that is equal to what? Negative K dH, and let's say this is Q sub X, so this would be dH dX. So Q sub X, I'm telling you it's equal to zero here. So what does that tell me about dH dX there? What's that? Yeah, dH dX has to be zero. If my Q is equal to zero, dH dX has to be equal to zero. That's the only way you have no flow. The only way I have no flow across this boundary is if the head gradient across that boundary is equal to zero. All right, so that, what happens is I get this, what we call an axis of symmetry, all right? The head gradient here is zero. And the way I can calculate the total drawdown in this well is by adding an imaginary well over here in the bedrock, right? We call this a image well. This is an imaginary well pumping at the same rate, all right? and the same distance away from my impermeable boundary, even though that doesn't look like it, it's the same distance. <laughs> Maybe I should just uh, move it somehow. Lasso select. All right. This is the same distance away from the boundary. So it's R away from the boundary and it is pumping at the same rate. So this is Q sub P and this is Q sub P, all right? This is an imaginary well, but what it means is that the total drawdown here can be calculated as the draw the hypothetical drawdown from this well plus the hypothetical drawdown from this well, which would be exactly like this one. And now at this boundary, this total drawdown is this plus this, and it will equal this. So at an impermeable boundary, we add an imaginary Add imaginary well, imaginary well, pumping at the same rate. And now the total drawdown is equal to the drawdown from my producing well plus the drawdown from my imaginary well.
So an impermeable boundary. Imaginary production well. Equidistant. From boundary. Pumping at the same rate. All right, and then I can calculate the total drawdown at any point as the drawdown of my true pumping well plus my imaginary image well. All right, so that is the um, an impermeable boundary. Now, let's consider the case where I've got a constant head boundary. For example, we've got, say, a stream like Lolo Creek running. All right, so here's a stream, Lolo Creek. And we've got a production well here. And it's pumping at Q sub P. All right, and now here's my drawdown cone. And after some time, this drawdown cone starts to intercept the stream. So the stream acts as a constant head boundary. So what does that mean? That means that by pumping the groundwater, I can't drop the water level inside the stream. And this makes intuitive sense. If I drop the water, you can't, the water has to run downhill. If I drop the water level inside the stream, then the water would run from the downstream and upstream into the, in, to where the pump was. That doesn't happen. So we're not gonna change the water level inside the stream. So this is now a constant head boundary. and I'm some distance away from it, R. So let's look at this now in, so this is in map view. If we look at it in cross section view, so here's, Here's the river. Here's my land surface. Here's my pumping well. So here's my here's my cone of depression 
that would exist if I didn't have a river. All right. And then let me, uh, I'm going to exaggerate this a little more. So here, this solid line is my initial head. This dashed line is my head sometime after pumping. And the dashed line is my hypothetical drawdown if I didn't have a river here. But my real drawdown is reduced because it has to come all the way back up to the river level at the river. And the drawdown is reduced because I'm losing water from the stream into my drawdown cone. So the way I deal with this scenario is to add equidistant from the river an imaginary injection well. And this puppy is injecting water. When we inject water, we make, instead of a cone of depression, we make a cone of impression. So now I've raised the water level here. It's got a imaginary cone that does something like this. I add these two together. And at the wet, at the river, my head will stay constant. So at a constant head boundary, we add an injection well. Equidistant to the river. All right, this computer is going to die here any second. So Finch, we'll see you on Thursday. Come to class Thursday if you can. We'll go to the computer lab. Oh, can't even type anymore. All right. So here's... <clears throat> What I want to do, I'm going to, um, <clears throat> 